you and super praying. We welcome you all to our morning Bible studies on the letter of Paul to Philippians. We have completed the first two chapters. We have two more chapters to go. And uh, I plan to go very slowly because every verse in the remaining passages is very, very profound, uh, so deep in content. So uh, I'll try to go slowly. Let's turn together to the third chapter of Philippians from verse 1. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and a safeguard for you. This uh, term rejoicing and joy occurs 14 times in the letter of the Philippians. And you can understand why. Because they went through suffering earlier. The Apostle Paul went through suffering earlier. And now he's in prison. So from a circumstantial point of view, there's no reason to rejoice. But our rejoicing is not because things are fine with us. Our rejoicing is because we have the hope of glory. Christ in us is hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 And because Christ lives in us, we have the joy of salvation. And Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And as we go through trials in the will of God, we have greater rewards in heaven. So Paul said, rejoice. Rejoice. Again I say rejoice. And I keep on reminding you because rejoicing is part of our calling in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16, 17, 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. And Romans, uh, sorry, not Ephesians 4.20 says, for everything give thanks. So again, is reminding them, rejoice. Don't worry about my circumstances. Don't worry what you're going through. We have the hope of glory. We rejoice in that glory. Then it goes on to explain, right in verse 2 onwards. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. But the word dogs referred to is a term used to describe those who love and practice falsehood. Look at the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 15, refers to people who love and practice falsehood. Mutilators of the flesh. In other words, people who destroy their own bodies by their lifestyle. It could be excessive behavior, whereby your body gets, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you abuse the body by the lifestyle and no regard for the will of God. So watch out for such people. Because what happens is when you are uh, yoked with people like that, subconsciously you get influenced by them. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, Paul writes, Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. You may have a good character, you have bad company and a yoke that company Good character gets corrupted by bad company. So he said, watch out. Watch out these people who come and abuse their bodies, who love and practice falsehood. And uh, the word dogs is used, strong term, but is a warning to God's people not to get caught up with the lifestyle of people who practice and love falsehood. Read Revelation 22nd chapter, verse 15, to understand the description of dogs, the, what the analogy that what dogs are given. Verse 3, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. As compared to these mutilators of the flesh, as compared to people who practice and love falsehood, we are the circumcision. Circumcision means people have been given the ritual of circumcision. Now, in the, uh, in the letter of Paul to Romans, he explains what is the advantage of being a Jew. What's the value of circumcision? They were given the ordinance of circumcision, which was actually putting off the flesh of the child on the eighth day, the foreskin of the penis, symbolic of putting off of the flesh. It's only symbolic. 
the real sakam god wants is sakamshan of the heart of all the evil things even the old testament time in jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4 the word of god says sakam says self to the lord sakam says heart to the lord sakam says your hearts the heart there are so many evil things that has been cut off so paul says don't go by all these people who love and practice falsehood who abuse their own bodies we are the circumcision we have been given the covenant of circumcision now what is so great about the jews when this question people ask even today why did god choose the israelites jews to be a special people children of god what of the rest of the world god wants the whole world to come and know him to come to know him and he gave the law to the israelites only on condition they would obey him romans chapter 3 verse 3 puts this question and gives the answer also romans 3 1 to 3 the question paul puts is what advantage is there in being a jew what value is in circumcision same question people ask today the apostle paul put the question and gave the answer in the next verse what's so special about jews what's so value of circumcision they are they are the circumcision why what is so special next verse first of all they were given the oracles of god they were given the word of god that's what makes them unique but before god gave them the commandments he asked them whether they would obey him when moses went up the mount of sinai to worship god god sent him back with a message to the israelites exodus 19 chapter 4 5 and 6 you as all know what i did to egypt how i had you eagles wings and brought you to myself now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession although the whole earth is mine you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation just like the lord chose the levites to be priests to the israelites the lord chose israel to be priests to all the nations and today you and me as god's people a priest a royal priest should be our so sakamshan actually a sakamshan of the heart by the spirit in the new testament romans 229 paul writes sakamshan is sakam in the heart by the spirit not by the written code such a man's praise is not from men it's from god when a person sakamshan the evil things in the heart removes all the unwanted things in the heart even before people come to know about it simply because god knows about it such a person is praised by god pleasing to god so first of all he said we are the circumcision is we who worship by the spirit of god worship is by the holy spirit the word worship basically means to bow down the little meaning of worship is to bow down we worship in song but more than worshiping in song or in words we should worship in our lives in our lives bowing down before god replacing our own ambitions our desires our will and replace it with god's ambitions for us his plans for us his desires for us worship is offering body the living sacrifice the spiritual act of worship very simply put it is obedience in response to devils trying to tempt jesus in an instant he showed him all the kings and kingdoms of this world and told jesus all this i'll give to you if you bow down before me matthew chapter 4 verse 3 or verse 9 sorry matthew 4:9 In verse 10 the lord replies is written worship god him alone shall you worship and the is quoting from the book of deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13 and then the original version which is quoting the word used for worship is actually fear the lord fear the lord fear in the lord the reverent fear of god which motivates us to obey him so true worship is obedience the holy spirit helps us obey the lord 
he makes us holy. Also, to worship God in words and in song, the Holy Spirit is the one who glorifies Jesus. In worshiping is to glorify the Lord. And in John 16, 14, Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, he will bring glory to me for taking what is mine and making known to you. So worship is first of all obedience and the result of obedience, singing to God, speaking to God and magnifying his name. Praising God to God is worship. But that worship must come from a pure heart. No Testament time, the Lord lamented about his people. In Jeremiah 29, 13. These people come near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of rules taught by men. Not led by the Spirit. So today, true worship is, first of all, obeying, obeying God joyfully. And the result of obedience we glorify his name in song and in words to lift up the name of Jesus. And then it goes on to say, next verse, first of all, circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus. Glorifying means to give him credit. These three words I want us all to understand. Glorifying the Lord, Exalting the Lord, praising the Lord. What do these things mean practically? Glorifying Jesus, exalting Jesus, and praising Jesus. To, to glorify him is to give him credit for everything in our lives, the good things in our lives. To give him credit, lift up his name, is to exalt him. Glorify him is to give him credit. To exalt him is to lift up his name to magnify his name, and to praise him is to speak well of him and not complaining to him, complaining about God to people, why God did this, why God did this, why me? People complain. No? Opposite of praising is complaining. So we don't complain against God to anyone, don't grumble, don't murmur, don't argue. We read about that in the second chapter of uh, Philippians, 14th verse. So here Paul talks about how we glory in Christ Jesus. To the, to the Romans, Romans chapter 15, verse 17, Paul writes, we glory in Jesus, I glory in Jesus in my service to God. I glory in Jesus in my service to God. Meaning, whatever he was, was by the grace of God. That's glorifying Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he writes, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace of him is not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God working within me. So glorifying means always giving him credit, never taking credit for yourself, and realizing our ministry is by grace and by his mercy. Second Corinthians 4 1, Paul writes, Since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Since through God's mercy we have the ministry, we don't lose heart, we don't give up. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Although I am less than the least of God's people, this grace was given to me to preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul understood his ministry and his life was the grace of God, the mercy of God, and thereby he glorified the Lord. So, talks about, we worship the Spirit of God, we glory in Christ Jesus, we don't take any glory for ourselves, and put no confidence in the flesh. Never putting confidence in yourself. Which means, in Christian life, we're not called to exercise self-confidence. They're called to exercise confidence in the Lord. A typical example is David facing Goliath. In 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 37, 
he tells the people, especially King Saul, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. His confidence was in the Lord. So as Christians, the term self-confidence must be replaced by confidence in Christ. Christ's confidence. When his callers do something, when he's given as a calling, he will justify the calling by giving us the resources to fulfill that calling. Romans chapter 8 verse 30 says, those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he calls, he justifies. By giving us the resources to fulfill that calling. Now we understand why. In Philippians 4.13, we'll come to that later, fourth chapter, Paul writes, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The focus is not on I can. The focus is he who gives me strength. So our confidence is, should be in the person or the, the, or go, or the God who gives us strength. In the Old Testament, it's written, Psalm 84, verse 5, Blessed is he whose strength is in the Lord. Blessed is he whose strength is in the Lord. Verse 7 says, he will go from strength to strength. The three beautiful aspects of ministry. We worship the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. But all confidence in the Lord, in the Spirit, opposite of flesh is spirit. Holy Spirit gives us empowerment. He gives us wisdom. And we trust in him. In fact, if you look at Romans 15, 17, Paul talks about glorifying Jesus Christ, glorying in Jesus. Verse 7, 18, he writes, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Leading the Gentiles, obey God. By what I said and done, by the power of signs, wonders, and miracles. By the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us for every aspect of Christian life and ministry. Christian life, to obey Him, to worship Him, a spiritual act of worship, which is offering bodies a living sacrifice, and to worship and praise Him is from the Spirit. That's why every aspect of Christian existence can be very effective only by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We are all totally dependent upon Him, not the flesh, but on Him. The Lord Jesus Christ anoints us with the Holy Spirit. He is the one who gives us the Holy Spirit's anointing for us to serve Him. Remember the time when, in the second chapter of Acts, when they're all filled with Spirit for the first time, anointed, and the people come all over the empire for the Feast of uh, Pentecost, Day of Pentecost, Feast of Harvest. Peter explains to all the people what was happening. Because they are surprised how these people are speaking in tongues and they are all in a different realm altogether. Yet the people thought they are drunk. And Peter explains. He talks about Jesus. Acts 2.33 Exalted to God's right hand, he received from the Father the promise for his spirit, whom he has poured out upon us. Who pours out? Jesus pours out. That's why even John the Baptist spoke about this baptism. In Mark chapter 1 verse 8, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. He who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Baptism means, in Greek, baptizo, or baptisma, two meanings, putting into, pouring out on. I put you into water for repentance, John the Baptist says, he who comes after me, referring to Jesus Christ, he will pour out his spirit upon you. So today, either we live by the spirit or we live by the flesh. Either we put confidence in the flesh or we put confidence in the spirit. When you move in the spirit, 
Nothing is impossible for us because nothing is impossible for God. He works through us. It's not be working for God. He's working through us. So three beautiful points here. Glory in Christ Jesus. Worship by the Spirit of God. And put no confidence in the flesh. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, third chapter, 5 and 6, I think 4 and 5, I think, Paul writes, not that we are ourselves to claim anything from God. Our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as means of new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, the spirit gives life. So three beautiful points for us to absorb, imbibe in our own life and mystery. Worship as spirit of God, glory in Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, but put all confidence in Jesus who gives us anointing to fulfill our calling. Then he goes on to say, verse 4, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. And he's talking about his earlier credentials. Credentials in the eyes of the Jews. For the Jews, Paul had all the qualifications to be a successful Jew and uh, to be looked up by people. And he was a big leader in his own right. And he had all the qualifications. So-called earthly qualifications. If you think you want to put count to the flesh, I've got more, he says. He talks about his credentials. Next verse, a second part of verse 4. If anyone else thinks he has risen to put count in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law, of the people of Israel, chosen by God to be priests to other nations, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning a typical Conventional, traditional Hebrew. In regard to the law of Pharisee. Now let's not forget that uh, the, the five kinds of Jews those days. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Herodians. Pharisees believed the entire Old Testament. Sardis is only the first five, five, five books of the Old Testament. That's why they don't believe in resurrection, Pharisees. Because resurrection is first mentioned in the Bible, in the Psalms. Psalm 16, verse 10. How God not let the Holy One see BK. Quoted in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 27, by Peter. So Sardis don't believe in resurrection. Pharisees believe. Pharisees always thought they're the only righteous people. In fact, there are many ways self-righteous people. So for a Pharisee to think he's righteous, others thought, oh, Pharisee is a Pharisee. Essenes were basically a sect who lived near the uh, 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 Qumran caves on the eastern part of the Dead Sea. They were a sort of sect of the Jews. And there were Herodians who were owed allegiance to Herod. And the Zealots who were basically rebelling against Roman rule. For religious point of view, Pharisees and Sadducees. And Pharisees are supposed to be the so-called most ardent, most uh, law-abiding uh, Israelites. So he says, in regard to law, a Pharisee. I kept all the laws according to the Pharisees. They're very strict for the law, the Pharisees. Then what about next point? As for zeal, the word for zeal in Greek is zealous. Zelos, Z D L O S. It means being zealous for what our cause you have got. As for zeal, first you judge. You know, at that time, there were many people who believed, many Jews who believed, that this group called the Nazarene sect or the way, Christians were referred to as the Nazarene sect or the way, W A Y, that these people are misguided people, that this is not the Messiah. He is misleading these people. And there are many people who believe that. But only there are people like the Apostle Paul, Paul or Saul, as he was known then. He went behind them. Zealous for whatever he believed. And persecuting, persecuting the church was a sign of zeal for Judaism. As for zeal, persecuting the church. 
There are many leaders who believe that this group is not the right group, the way the another insect. But Saul was different. Not only believed that, he acted upon that. He was zealous, being zealous for whatever he believed. So his zeal was reflected in him persecuting the church. In a way, he's saying, me persecuting the church was a qualification as a Jew, as an as adherence to Judaism. But he was misguided, he was ignorant, blinded, in fact. But he had zeal, zeal without knowledge. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. And the word for faultless, amemptos. Amemptos, which means blameless. As far as legalistic righteousness is concerned, following the law to the letter, I was blameless. I was sincere in my doing whatever I'm supposed to do. Look at all these qualifications. You realize, see, you know, I've got more things to be proud about. Because I kept all these things, all the qualities I've got. But I put no confidence in the flesh. I have reasons. From a Jewish point of view, from a human point of view, I have a reason to be proud about my heritage. But I don't put confidence in that. My confidence is in the Lord. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit. I chat many times before, you, uh, before with you that the Apostle Paul was not a naturally gifted speaker. He's not a trained speaker. Second Corinthians 11, chapter 6. The Corinthians thought of him as a person and writing is very, very powerful in writing, very forceful, very weighty. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. But in person, he's unimpressive and his speaking amounted to nothing. That's what they thought. Look at the ministry he had. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 4 and 5, he writes, My message and my preaching are not the wise and persuasive words, but the demonstration of the Spirit's power. Their faith does not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Totally depend upon the Spirit, on Jesus, who empowered him to speak the way he did, entirely by the Holy Spirit. So all of us can see the same Spirit today. We can be anointed by Jesus, we can be anointed by Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, to fulfill whatever your call and our call is in our lives. But never put confidence in yourself. Always put a confidence in the Lord. And then you see how you glorify Him, put confidence in Him, and worship Him in spirit. We have an effective, joyful ministry. So all the qualifications, I go through all the months again. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, regard a law, a Pharisee, the highest among the five sects of groups of uh, Jews, Pharisee, very zealous for the law, as for zeal, persevering the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless, blameless, amemptos, blameless. But it goes on to say, but whatever was for my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. Knowing. The word knowing is from a Greek word called gnosios. G-N-O-S-E-O-S. Gnosios. It means experiencing. That they experience Christ. Now. Not academic knowing, but experiencing. Everything I had before, which I could be proud about, in the eyes of the Jews, the leader of the Jews, it's all loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus. So all of us will realize our identity is we know Jesus. We are his children. Paul said, I could boast about my credentials. I'll close with one last verse in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 9, 2024. Jeremiah 9 chapter 23 and 24. 
Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, the strong man of his strength, the rich man of his riches. Let him boast, boast about this. He understands and knows me. For I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness, for in these I delight. We are all called to boast about Jesus that we know him. He revealed himself to us. Boast of the cross, not about our credentials, what we achieved in life. It's all rubbish. They don't talk about all this dung. Come back to knowing Jesus, experiencing Jesus. God bless you all. We'll carry on again on Friday. I'm very excited this passage, beautiful passage. We're going to learn so much about from this and to learn about how to boast in the Lord. God bless you all. We'll meet again on Friday and have a Q&A session till, 9 till 10 o'clock. God bless you.